Good morning. Uh, Callie, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, Nick at the rally reminded me of a quote from uh, Madeline, uh, two hands at work uh, accomplish far more than a thousand clasped in prayer. And I want to paraphrase her a little bit, two hands on a keyboard can accomplish quite a bit more uh, than a thousand hands clasped in prayer as well. And I'm going to um, walk you through some effective ways of doing that today. Um, late, late last year in October, um, Allison and I at the American Atheist uh, Legal Center down in DC, over in DC I suppose, um, started a project called Atheists Engage. And it is an effort by American Atheists to encourage and support atheists who engage with their elected officials, local government agencies, um, government officials generally on social media on their official social media accounts. One of the problems that the atheist community faces is we don't participate as much as we should. Um, I've got some statistics up here from Pew Research Center from 2014. In Ohio and Kentucky in 2014, 22% of the population, nearly a quarter, were, were nuns, N-O-N-E-S. In Indiana, that number was even higher, 26%. So that was five years ago. Those numbers have undoubtedly grown to over a quarter in Ohio and Kentucky. And in, in Indiana, we don't know. We don't have the numbers yet. Um, but in 2016, when they did exit polls in Ohio, and they didn't apparently bother to do some detailed exit polls in Kentucky and Indiana. I can't imagine why. Um, in 2016, only 16% of the nuns went out and voted. And that's a big problem. Because when we have a quarter of our you know, population, our portion of the population not showing up at the polls, our elected officials, the people who run agencies, don't realize the size and, and power that we have in our communities. So, what that results in is things like this. This is uh, Senator Jason Rapert from Arkansas. Um, he, he's a defendant in a lawsuit we brought that we'll be discussing in a panel in about half an hour. Um, but he posted on Facebook in response to somebody criticizing his separate, his policies regarding the separation of religion and government. He said, don't you think it's a bit discriminatory for atheists who happen to only re represent 3% of our population, by the way, to cause turmoil and want a policy in which a person who is also a Christian pastor to not be allowed to speak in public. Now, we'll skate by the um, uh, legal obfuscations he's making there and just focus on the 3% because that's not true. And um, when we don't participate, this is the kind of thing that happens. And what he's doing here, what many elected officials do, is downplaying the importance of our voice. And that makes us disinclined to use our voice. And it also makes other people in our communities disinclined to listen, which is why we have to use our voice particularly online. This is a quote from Justice Anthony Kennedy, who so recently graciously gave us Justice Kavanaugh. Social media can provide perhaps the most powerful mechanism available to a private citizen to make his or her voice heard. They allow a person with an internet connection to become a town crier with a voice that resonates farther than it could from any soapbox. And he's exactly right. Social media gives you the power to reach so many different audiences. There's the government official you're addressing themselves. There's the other people in your community. There are other people in other communities who may hear about a controversy or something and do a Google search and find your comments. There are people years from now who will look back. I mean, Twitter is cataloging, or the Library of Congress is cataloging every tweet that's sent. And those will be maintained for the foreseeable future. 
So you're not only talking to the people in your constituency now, but you're talking to the people in your constituency 10 years from now, 100 years from now. Now, how, if you encounter a government, let's say your local school board is um, trying to put in place an abstinence-only sex ed program. That's something we've been talking about a lot uh, this weekend. And you want to speak out on the issue. You can, of course, go to your school board meetings, and we absolutely encourage you to do that. You can vote for your board members, but you can also speak out online. And I want to explain to you how to do that in a way that protects you and serves uh, our community. The first thing to do is to stay focused. Don't get diverted by someone saying, you know, oh, you know, you, you're an atheist, you don't have any morals, why do you care about sex ed or you know, any number of other things that might distract you from the point that you're trying to make when they comment on your comment. Stay focused on your issue. Second is be substantive. Don't just put out there, hey, I think you should put in you know, medically accurate sex education. Well, that's great, but that doesn't give them a lot of other information that they could really use. And then members of your community could use to do some research, find out what you're talking about, find out whether or not they agree with you. So it's important that you not simply like shout out and then sit down, figuratively speaking. Third, and this shouldn't be a problem for this crowd, but in your statements online, identify as an atheist. Normally I have a slide here that talks about free thinker, humanist, secular progressive, all the other words we like to use when we don't want to say the word atheist. Politicians have in their heads little buckets of people, essentially, and they have a bucket for atheist, a bucket for agnostic, a bucket for humanism, and they think of those as all different things when really those of us in this room know that we're one big community, but we label ourselves different ways. So I want to encourage all of you to identify as atheists. I don't think you need convincing to use the word atheists, but I want to point out that you should include that in your statement. Next, be respectful. This is not, you know, a debate with somebody on Twitter where you get in a shouting match, flame war or something like that, you're talking to a government official. So be respectful. Not only because it's more likely to uh, maintain their attention, but also because it represents our community well to others. There's a lot of other information available at atheistsengage.org, the website we put up back in October for this program. When you engage, if you tweet at your, let's say you tweet at Sherrod Brown about something, um, tag it with Atheists Engage and we'll promote the fact that you are engaging and hopefully get other people from Ohio to do the same. You can tag it Atheists Engage, you can tag us at American Atheist, no S at the end, um, and take a screenshot and send it to me, send it to um, any member of our staff really. Now. Let's talk about staying focused. First, keep in mind what your goal is. Like I said, you don't want to get distracted by somebody attacking you because you identified yourself as an atheist. You want to stay on point. You also want to keep your audience in mind. You're speaking in the immediate to two people. You're speaking to your government official and you're speaking to the other people in your community. And it's important in both of those cases to remain respectful, remain on point, because you want to be taken seriously. And there is a time and a place for getting, you know, really fiery. Let me rephrase that. There's a time and a place for getting combative. And I'm, I myself have done it plenty. Um, I, my proudest Twitter moment was when I got somebody to tweet at me in tongues. It was, it was <laughs> sublime. I was so happy. I particularly loved the uh, alternative spelling of choir, Q-U-I-R-E. Um, but this has a time and place. 
It's not when you're engaging with government officials. You have to have a, a town hall mentality. And you have to identify as an atheist. It enriches your message. When you say, I'm an atheist and so I think this, it, it grabs someone's attention because a lot of people are afraid to say that. And it gives more substance to what you're saying. It, by saying, I'm an atheist and it's important to me that our children have a proper understanding of sex education, you're letting people know some of what our core beliefs are. You're also letting people know where, um, where your motivations are. Uh, it, it just enriches your message to say what, what community you're from. Like I said, maintain a town hall mentality. While I realize that you're on Facebook and you're behind a computer screen, or you're on Twitter, or you're on Instagram. Some public officials have Instagram accounts. I, I learned this about six months ago. I had no idea. <laughs> um, I realize you're behind a screen and there's a sense of anonymity, but you have to think of yourself as standing behind a podium like this facing your school board and have that mentality in mind. You don't want to share fake news, by the way. Don't be accused of that. If you make a factual statement that's potentially controversial or contrary to what they're claiming, Cite a source. If you want to quote the Bible at them, which we're all kind of prone to doing in some situations, um, give them chapter and verse because somebody else is going to read that message and be like, the Bible doesn't really say how you can have an abortion, how you can induce an abortion. And it does. So if you give them the quote that, of course, I don't immediately have to mind, unfortunately, um, Numbers 5.11, thank you. See, this is what I'm talking about. That, by the way, <laughs> Robert, thank you. That's one of our plaintiffs in the case that we're going to be talking about in a little bit. Um, then someone else can look at it and go, oh, crap. The Bible really does say if you do these kinds of things, you know, like drink some dust mixed with other things, you'll induce an abortion if the woman was cheating on you when she got pregnant. And maybe that might change their mind a little bit or make them a little more curious about, wait, what else does the Bible say? Oh, it, it endorses slavery. It endorses, you know, bride price. It changes minds. And again, be respectful. And I'm going to recognize now the irony of starting a list with don't focus on the negative, and it's a list entirely of don'ts. But I couldn't help it. Don't focus on the negative. What I mean by that is... We're too prone to criticizing officials when they do the wrong thing. We have to make an effort to thank and encourage and show our appreciation when the officials do the right thing. We have to encourage the officials that we think will likely do the right thing to do it. Because all too often the people who are talking to them are the ones saying, you know, you uh, want to teach kindergartners how to have sex or something absurd. And they need to hear from us that no, you're trying to give our children factual information that they can use. To, to use the sex ed example that we've been uh, focusing particularly on this weekend. Don't use profanity. Um, it, it's not necessarily something that they could legally block you from commenting over, but it makes their case a little more palatable to a lot of people. Well, you know, they said, they said the F word, so, you know, it's fine. Don't spam the account. Don't just say, there is no God, over and over and over again. It doesn't accomplish anything. It also represents us poorly in the community because you're not being substantive. You're not adding to the conversation. And don't make defamatory statements because those are actionable. Those they could sue you. Like, don't accuse somebody of committing a crime or something like that. Now let's talk about where you should engage, because this is really important, and I'm going to get to why in a minute. We want to engage with our elected officials on their official accounts. Everybody, well, not everybody, most people today have a Facebook page, their own personal Facebook profile where they share, 
you know, pictures of their kids with their friends. Grandma posts, you know, oh, my daughter did a recital and here's a video. Those are not where you want to be engaging your government officials on their personal Facebook profiles. You want to engage on their official Facebook pages, official Twitter accounts, and I'll explain to you in a bit how to distinguish between the two. But the point is that the First Amendment protects you when you are engaging with them on their official social media platforms. The First Amendment has no bearing on what they do with their personal Facebook profiles. So in, I, I want to just encourage you to avoid their personal accounts and also campaign accounts. Campaigns are generally private organizations, well, not generally. Campaigns are always private entities. And as a result, they have a First Amendment right as well to present the message that they want to present. And that can include blocking people who are criticizing the candidate that they're trying to promote. So the First Amendment protects you only on official social media accounts. So now let's get into the First Amendment a bit because it's gonna come into play when inevitably somebody blocks you, somebody deletes your critical comment. Viewpoint discrimination is an egregious form of content discrimination. The government must abstain from regulating speech when the opinion or perspective of the speaker is the rationale for the restriction. Justice Kennedy, again, I don't think we're gonna get the same from Justice Kavanaugh. So a few key First Amendment points to keep in mind. The First Amendment only restricts the actions of the government, not them work on their personal, private Facebook profile or anything like that. But on government-controlled, government-operated accounts, viewpoint discrimination is prohibited. In some circumstances, when you're in a, a, a traditional public forum, which I'll get to in a second, um, which doesn't generally apply to social media, um, they can restrict the time, place, and manner in which you speak, but they cannot still control the perspective that you're bringing, the statements that you're making, only the, the means by which you do it. I mentioned a, a traditional public forum. There are briefly, four types of places in which people engage in speech um, that could be subject to government control. There are traditional public forums, sidewalks, parks, Fountain Square is a great example. These are areas which have been used throughout human civilization for public expression of viewpoints. In this space, the government essentially um, can put, uh, again, only controls on when and how you engage in speech. So you can't strike up a jazz band at 90 decibels in the middle of Fountain Square at three in the morning. Um, that's totally fine, that's not censorship. What they can't do is say, we can, we'll, we'll, allow, you know, we'll allow the country music band but not the jazz band because that would be um, not content neutral. Then there are designated public forums. These are spaces that the government has set out um, specially for public speech that is not limited by the topic that you're discussing. Third, there's designated limited public forums, and I'm gonna, I realize I'm getting into the legalese, but I'm gonna breeze through it hopefully pretty quickly. A designated limited public forum is a space designated by the government for discussion of a limited topic. And lastly, there are also things called non-public forums. The important thing to keep in mind in all of these is that in none of them can the government say, you can't speak here because I don't agree with what you're going to say. That's the key. Now, how does this apply to social media? Government official social media accounts, we believe, and virtually every court that has addressed this issue has agreed, are designated and potentially limited public forums. They're government created. Sometimes they are used for limited topics. You know, you're not, gonna, you're not going to post to the, um, 
county labor board about the sex ed policy in your school district because it's wildly off topic. But again, they cannot place any restrictions on your viewpoint. They can't say that because you disagree with them or criticize them that you can be excluded from that platform. How do you know if something is a government account? Well, just back in January, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, which covers Maryland and Virginia, um, handed down the Davison uh, Randall v. Now, see, I'm going to blank on the case name. <laughs> um, Davison v. Loudoun County. And in that decision, they, they outlined the hallmarks of a public forum where the First Amendment applies. And it's a forum that is intentionally open for public discourse. Again, sounds like a social media page. Open to all constituents. Open to discussion of any issue. Unrestricted access. And a space that's compatible with expressive activity. Again, that sounds a lot like social media. Now, let's talk about open to all constituents. Twitter, for example, has a function whereby you can protect your tweets. Only people that you specifically approve um, can view your tweets. That would be an example of a forum that is not open to all constituents. It's only open to the ones that they approve and allow into their group. I wouldn't be surprised if someone set up a campaign Twitter account where they had to, you know, where you had to be approved in order to be able to see their tweets and comment on them. But these are the key uh, factors that were outlined by the court for what makes a social media account a government controlled First Amendment protected space. Some other things to consider and kind of what those factors are getting at is what is the intent of the people who opened the account? What is the intent of the person who, who created that forum? Very often, they'll make it easy for you and say, this is, you know, my, I'm your state senator and this is created for the purpose of uh, communication between me and my, my constituents. And that's fantastic because they've stated right up front, I'm intending this to be a public forum for people to engage in speech. Sometimes, if they don't say that, you might need to look at the content. Are they asking people for their opinions? Are people offering their opinions and the government official is engaging with them and asking for feedback? You know, I'm supporting this bill, what do you think? Should I support this bill, what do you think? Sometimes they'll throw up polls. Twitter has a function where you can ask a question and, and have uh, people who see the tweets vote on which one they prefer. That's kind of the definition of asking for input. Um, another thing to look at, and this isn't necessarily determinative, is do they use their government title in the title of the account? I'll jump back to Senator Jason Rapert, where his Facebook page says Senator Jason Rapert. He also has a separate campaign account, which indicates that this one, with my official title and distinct from my campaign account, is my official account. You can also look at links to their websites um, and, and other things of that nature. I want to touch back on, on uh, Senator Sherrod Brown because he does an excellent job of doing this. You'll notice the one on the left, Office of the United States Senator Sherrod Brown, proud to serve Ohio, tweets from Sherrod, signed SB. And then below that, a couple lines, it says brown.senate.gov. That's a link to his Senate profile. Then he has a separate account where it says, Sherrod Brown, U.S. Senate candidate, Ohio, grandfather, husband, Indians fan, proud Ohioan, and below, SherrodBrown.com, his campaign site. He has done an excellent job, and I actually happened to run into him on a plane um, and complimented him on this because he does an excellent job of dividing his official social media from his private social media. So what's not permitted? What can they not do when you speak out? And the rule of thumb is anything that's going to have a chilling effect on speech. Now, some things jump immediately to mind. Being blocked, that's going to chill your speech because it keeps you from speaking to them entirely. Being, uh, Twitter calls it banned, I believe. Um, or maybe I have those backwards, but regardless. 
Um, deleting your comments is pretty explicitly chilling speech. But there are other forms, including uh, commenting on your post, singling you out for negative, uh, you know, negative treatment, opprobrium. Um, for instance, here's a comment again from Senator Jason Rabert. Someone, a guy named Adam Valentine, we don't know what he said, by the way, because Rapert deleted his comment. Adam Valentine, your insults reveal your black heart. You know nothing except regurgitating what some other extreme liberal has put on a blog or post. How silly of anyone to think you would have the intellect to know real news from fake news. I don't normally waste my time replying to blowhards like you, but I want you to know that none of us will bow down to you, the FFRF, or any extreme liberal atheist organization. Ever mark it down. Now, he's, if he had not blocked Adam Valentine's comment, we would know what Adam said. But his content here is still singling him out incredibly negatively and making it less likely that Adam is going to talk again because he doesn't want to be subjected to that. It's making other people who wouldn't even, let's say he just deleted Adam's, tweet, Adam's comment. Other people who come to the page would not have any idea that Adam had commented at all. But he posts this and discourages anyone else from speaking out from the perspective that Adam had. Now I don't, again, know what comment Adam made, but I know that plenty of people probably saw that and decided, you know what, I don't wanna deal with that. I'm not gonna say what I was gonna say. And that's chilling free speech. That's censorship. And if that happens to you, if you're blocked, if your comments are deleted, if you're attacked like that, let me know. Go to atheist.org slash violation. Report it to us. Because we will do everything we can to make sure it doesn't happen again. Thank you.